All right, so thanks you for the uh, organizer for inviting me here today. I'm Jill and I'm from the University of Copenhagen. I'll talk a little bit about our project of how or if the northern sessile loads can profit from southern genetic variations in the face of climate change. All right, so I'm not the only person working on this project, so just to a little bit of acknowledgement here, Alvin, who is the other postdoc working heavily on this project, and Eric, who is the PI, then Jun, Lene, Kata, and Christian, who are collaborators on the project, and then, of course, our lab technician, Lena, who helps in the lab, and also the funding agency uh, for support. All right, so as we are heading to the end of the day, I think we heard this already plenty of time, but we all know that with Climate change will see an increase in frequency and length of drought spells. So our main objective here is to ensure a healthy and productive Danish oak forest, even under future climates. And as we also all know, forests are valuable resources. They are resources for new renewable material and also for sinks for carbon storage. And will thus be essential for our transition to a greener, most sustainable uh, future but they also provide essential, bio, uh, essential ecosystem services and support for biodiversity. However, there are forest species are extremely challenged by the rapid climate change, and we saw this in action in the northern parts of Europe in the dry summers in 2018 and 2019. We saw a huge increase in our uh, dieback, forest dieback. And oaks will be particularly valuable for the future because they are basically expected to be a little bit more resistant to this climate change. So what we are taking advantage of is that, as we have seen numerous speakers here today say, is that we have these European white oaks with large overlapping distribution ranges. Uh, and in areas of sy uh, sympathy, these closely related species can actually hybridize and exchange genes with each other. So we are taking advantage of this uh, where we look at uh, gene flow both within species but also between the species. All right. And Despite this ongoing gene flow, these species are actually to some extent kept as good species. And part of that is because they're uh, utilizing different ecological niches, such as the uh, more southern species are more drought tolerant, whereas the more northern species, such as Crocus robo, is more cold or wet tolerant. All right. So the first thing that we are looking at is this within species movement of genes. So basically, we ask the question whether Enrichment with alleles beneficial for dry conditions from the southern provenances here of Crocus petraea uh, that is uh, often is subjected to dry condition if they can enhance the adaptive potential of our Danish uh, petraea to future drier climates. The aim here is to detect loci in uh, petraea that are associated with bioclimatic variables uh, describing local temperature and precipitation. All right, so to our disposal, we have a common garden provenance trial in Denmark here that is uh, uh, representing 18 European provenances from uh, different countries such as Norway, Denmark, England, Belgium, um, Germany, France, Poland, and Hungary. And we have whole genome sequencing these individuals. And uh, also cold SNPs, and what we're looking at is about 2 million SNPs after filtering. And we're evaluating these two million SNPs in the landscape genomic uh, framework. Uh, and I'm going to show you the data or the results, preliminary results from two different bioclimatic variables, the mean annual temperature and the total annual precipitation. And what we do is that we take these SNPs or the regions around these SNPs and we blast it against the old gene annotations in order to detect uh, candidate genes of interest. All right. So this is what I'm going to show you, just a quick overview of what it is. This is the different uh, spots here are a SNP, and you walk along the, uh, the genome chromosome by chromosome, here highlighted by different colors. Uh, and on the X, uh, Y axis here, we just have the negative logarithm uh, of the p-values here. Uh, whereas the dashed line is our significant level, here represented by false discovery rate. And any SNPs or any point above that line is a significant association to the bioclimatic variable of interest. Here, annual mean temperature, and you can see the spread in that bioclimatic variable across our um, different provenance uh, to your right. Okay, so we can start looking into what is in this uh, 
particular SNPs above this significance level. So for example, this particular location here is actually a SNP that is just downstream of a gene that we know is involved in uh, responses to heavy metal stress. And these responses can also activate drought uh, stress genes. And what we see if we look specifically on the frequency of these reference allele, we can see a nice correlation between a decrease in the reference allele frequencies with increasing uh, temperatures. It's a nice good candidate gene. We can also look at something different, such as this one here. It's also, it's a light downstream of a gene that we know is overexpressed in our rhabdopsis up on heat. So again, a good candidate gene with a really nice pattern and a really nice correlation here with an increase in the frequency of the reference allele with increasing mean temperature. And finally, we can also look at these two uh, SNPs here that are downstream of a gene that is involved in saline stress. Okay, and again, we see nice uh, correlations here with increased mean temperature and the frequency of the reference allele. As you have, might have noticed, we have a, a couple of genetic outliers, and I will come back to that in that we have Norway and sometimes also Poland being a bit of a genetic outlier in this composition. All right, we can also look at a different bryocholamatic rail, well, such as total annual precipitation. And as I think we can all appreciate, the pattern is much more uh, complicated and it's a uh, all by a sudden we get hundreds and hundreds of SNPs associated with this particular bioclimatic variable. So I'm only, I'm only looking at the high top scores from each chromosome at the moment. Uh, so we can, for example, have a look at this one here. It's a scarecrow-like protein that's involved in root formation. And it's also known that other scarecrow-like proteins are involved in drought stress response. And in this case, this SNP actually sits within the gene itself. And again, we see a nice correlation, significant correlation with increase in the frequency of the reference allele with increased annual precipitation. But I think we can all appreciate that we have a specific provenance here in Norway that is pulling this association. And we can also see that it is a biclimatic outlier here, okay? Okay, similar, we can see a similar pattern in a different SNP here along the chromosome three. Again, the, now this SNP lies quite far upstream of a gene, but it's a gene that is, uh, that is known to bind to cell wall polysaccharides, and other genes within this family are actually associated with drought. Okay, again, uh, Norway is pulling the significant correlation here to quite a lot of things. Okay, and then I don't think I can get away without talking about this uh, quite um, high peak that stretch a large range on chromosome 9. Okay, within here we have a large number of SNPs that are associated, and I'm only looking at the top scorers at the moment, but we have a lot of genes within these top scorers, right? So we have some turpentine synthesis that we know are downregulated under drought. We have a PEX gene uh, that we know is downregulated by ABA, which is the drought stress hormone, and it's also a differential expressed under drought. We also have a SNP in a gene, uh, an FLA gene that is involved in salt, salt stress, so also the stress response that is highly correlated with the drought stress. Uh, but again, in all these cases, Norway is actually pulling these associations. All right. So what happens if we remove Norway from uh, the, the pot? All right, so this is how it looks if I remove Norway from the data set, and as you can appreciate, the data set now looks in a completely different matter, right? And now it's a little bit cleaner and fewer SNPs that are associated here. Despite that, we can have some nice good correlation or associations, for example, to this uh, SNP within a gene uh, that might be a good candidate uh, for a drought stress relief gene. But as you can see now, our nice significant correlation in uh, frequency of the alleles is actually disappearing. And the reason why this is probably popping up as a still significant association is because it detects the difference between Poland and uh, Belgium here. All right. But in general, we lose all of these nice drought-related genes, okay? So a lot of these SNPs are within genes that seems to be more of housekeeping functions. And in all cases so far that I've looked at, this significant correlation between frequencies and alleles and uh, the bioclimatic variable is actually completely disappearing unless I have Norway in there. All right. So is there a need for genetic movement or is selection and standing genetic variation within Denmark still sufficient? So, okay, so if we 
uh, if we agree to include Norway here, I mean, we do have this scarecrow pro uh, scarecrow-like protein that seems to be nice. It might actually not be the signal for drought, but rather for wetness or tolerance to wetness here. But in this case, if we want to enhance the adaptive potential of the Danish population sitting down here, we would, like, we would need to have gene movements because we have very few trees with that particular allele that seems to be associated with the tolerance. The other case is much better and maybe more promising in that this particular gene involved in heat stress or seemed to be involved in heat stress in our Here we actually have quite a large of, uh, genetic standing genetic variation that we can actually act on selection. And in this case, we wouldn't need any movement of genes. All right, so so far I've told you about this uh, utilization of the large distribution ranges and movement of alleles and uh, genes between, within a species between populations. But how does it look if we, can we take advantage of this uh, between species variation as well, in that the more southern species generally are more drought tolerant? Can we see that genetic movements between species can actually facilitate this climate adaptation? And here the aim is to detect genetic loci with a large difference in frequency between the different species. And this is more of an ongoing project, uh, and the results are not completely clear and are finished yet. But again, what we have at this disposal is that we have a European-wide uh, Proterra collection. We have some Rorbu species from Denmark and Germany, and then we have a single uh, provenance from Turkey that uh, is a pubescent sample. Again, we're whole genome sequencing these individuals, but in this case, because we're looking at more population genomic analysis, what we have done is uh, that we have called SNFT in the package, uh, or in the, um, yeah, Packets angst, which takes into these uh, genotype likelihoods rather than uh, actual genotypes in itself. Okay, and we have analyzed this data in a traditional population genomic uh, framework, looking at admixture and FST scans, etc. Okay, so well, the first thing we can see, and as we already knew and expected, is that we have genetic movement between these species. So if we look at this PCA, what we have is a quite clear, uh, di distinct. Uh, location of uh, Rubo in one side, Petraea on the other side, and then this pubescence uh, prominence on the top here. But we can also see that we have quite a large number of individuals that lies between these uh, bigger clusters. And these are individuals that are uh, show genetic uh, admixture between the populations. And we also see that in this admixture uh, analysis here, where each bar is an individual and each color represents the species in this case. Okay? So whereas Robo and our pubescence uh, provenance here look nice and clear, what the Petraea looks like is like we have quite a lot of genetic mixture into the Petra different Petraea provenances across Europe. And now I would like to point out Norway here. As we said, it was a genetic outlier and also a bioclimatic outlier. It seems to have a lot of admixture with uh, Robo, which is maybe expected because it's in the northern rim of uh, the Petraea range. And then we have Poland, and to some extent, uh, Hungarian provenances here actually showing quite a large influences from pubescence, which could be why we see Poland also pulling some of these in, uh, or showing this genetic uh, outlier uh, kind of thing. All right. So finally, I'm just going to show some really preliminary analysis where we have looked at uh, uh, FST scans across the genome. Again, here the same idea. We move across the genome with different chromosomes here. But here each dot is 10,000 base pairs, and the FST is a median within those 10,000 uh, base pairs. And we can do the different comparisons between the different uh, species, where the uh, full line here is the med median, no, mean across the entire genome, and then the dashed line is the 99 percentile. So basically what we'd consider is that we consider all of these points or regions of the genome above that 99 percentile as a genomic outlier. And then our idea is, or what we would like to do, is to look at detailed analysis of the genes located within these regions to see if they are in some way overlapped with the, uh, with the SNPs or the genes that we have already detected in our landscape genomic analysis. All right. So I guess I'll end here on a conclusion, is that, I mean, I guess we can conclude that movement off or selection on alleles from southern provenances or, and or more drought-tolerant species might actually enhance 
might be able to enhance the adaptive potential of our Danish oaks to future drier climates. And I think with that, I will finish and say thank you and ask if you have questions. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Jill, for a very interesting talk. Um, I guess there are some questions. Yeah, please. <laughs> I'm, uh, this was just fantastic. Thank you so much. I'm curious to know, uh, for your climate data that you're using for your associations, tell me about that climate data. Is it 30-year averages? What is the time frame of that climate data? And would that matter for your associations? All right. So the climate data, uh, I'm not responsible for the climate data. <laughs> I've been given it, I believe, so it's the Chelsea data set, which I believe is climate data spanning the last 30 or 50 years. And then uh, I think it's averages from those that we're using. But I'm not 100% sure. <laughs> i trying looking at Christian a little bit because, <laughs> but uh, yeah. But yeah, I agree. So I've also looked at the well claimed data and I get very similar results. Okay. Yeah. yeah. If that was your follow-up question. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Any more questions? Yeah, Berthold. Hello, thank you. It's me here. <laughs> um, yes, right behind the lamp. Um, I, I was just wondering, you, you would be interested in imp importing some gene variants uh, from these, those southern provenances, but, uh, but probably not the, the whole rest of the genome. So how would, how would you deal with that problem? Yeah, so that's absolutely true. So, I mean, I think the best scenario would be that we can select on the genes that are already in the standing genetic variation within uh, the Danish population, because then that we would avoid importing the whole genome uh, from, uh, from the other provenances, which is why we're interested in this, like where do we need gene movement or do, is selection and standing genetic variation already enough? Uh, in, the other, in a scenario where we would have to import gene variants, I mean, that's a really long process uh, of back crosses and uh, so forth and so forth. And I mean, for oaks, we are looking at hundreds of years ahead of time. Um, and in that case, I mean, I'm all for doing all of these new fancy uh, technologies with CRISPR-Cas, and that would be possible if it would be allowed to then uh, outplant these uh, species, which at the moment it isn't within the EU, as far as I know, um, as it's considered a uh, GMO plant under the current re regulations. Yeah. And I guess it's not so easy because you, um, um, uh, in, in fact, you, you like to get the genes from Quercus pubescens to Quercus robur, but you have to use Quercus petrea as a link. Yes. No? That's, that's, the, that's, yeah. that's a problem. Yes. Yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> would be easier if Quercus pubescens and Quercus robur would, would also hybridizing, yeah. but they, they don't. It could do, also yeah. be that they do, but that we lack that <coughs> populations in our data set, but I don't think there is. <laughs> yeah. Any more questions? Yeah. Over there, Richard. Thanks, Jill. That's that's really interesting. Um, can I just check? I understood correctly, and sorry, this is very simplistic. But um, so, in your original GWAS, you did include population structure as a covariate. But despite that, when you removed Norway, you still lost. Yes, yeah, so um, it's included in the. So when you evaluate these in a landscape genomic fashion in the Lea free, it's included as a covariance, and we still see that. Uh, yeah. Okay, I see no more questions. Are there any questions online? No. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, thank you again, Jill, for your interesting talk. <laughs>